This is the Self Taught or Not podcast with Dylan Israel and Eric Hanchett, where we teach you the do's and don'ts of software development from two software development professionals, one self taught and one not. Uh, all right, man. So, um, we're starting this off a little differently, doing those cold opens. I like, I like the cold opens myself. Those are the podcasts I like. So, um, you know, why don't, why don't you tell us what you've been up to since our last episode? Yeah, it's been pretty crazy. So I've been traveling for work and for, I was in Austin for a week and then I went on a cruise with some family. Um, so I, I, if you don't know, I've, I do lots of YouTube videos, lots of stuff outside of work just for fun. And so I'm really excited now as I'm working on a, a course for Vue.js. So Vue.js has been uh, kind of a passion of mine, just learning and then teaching other people about Vue.js and just keeping up with the Vue.js environment. So I've really been thinking like, how can I take the concepts I've been learning and put it into a course? I did a course last year called Create Awesome Vue.js Apps with Nuxt.js, but the focus is more on Nuxt, which is another framework that's kind of built on top of Vue for single, um, for server-side rendered Vue apps. But the view course I want to do is more um, like here, let's build a couple of a couple of real world type websites. We're going to maybe even use something like Vuetify, which is like a material design library. So I'm putting together the curriculum right now, just really trying to get into what I need to put into it. And also I'm trying to, I'm also trying some time boxing techniques. Have you ever done any of those like Pomodoro, things like that? Oh, uh, when I first started, uh, I I did a lot of Pomodoro because like Free Code Camp recommended, and I build like a project in it. Um, nowadays, how I I do it is on the weekends. I do it in between the League of Legends gameplays that are going on, which is about <laughs> fifty minutes, or I just go until I can't go, and then I go eat until I get hungry usually. So, which is about three four hours. Yeah, that's kind of the same approach I've been doing. Is like a lot of times I just keep going until I can't. But the problem is. Um, there's times where I need to like do editing and come up with topics and come up with outlines. And then there's time I need to do video. And when I do, I have two kids, a seven year old and a nine year old. And I've, if you ever listen to this podcast, you might hear sometimes little screaming in the background. That's my kids. So I have to find, but if I do video, I have to find times where they're not crazy and screaming. So I'm trying to think of like, they go back to school in a couple of weeks. I'm thinking like maybe um, they go to bed earlier when they, like the summer they get they stay up pretty late and it's really hard to do videos but in the summer the, or in, in the fall when they were back in school they go to bed earlier so i'm going to probably do some videos at night and i'm also trying to think of times i can come home from work to do videos and also do some more youtube videos so yeah that's what i'm thinking and doing just trying to get this course together trying to get the outline together and thinking about the future if anybody's interested you can go to program with eric.com i don't have a landing page or anything for the view course up but if you go to program with eric.com i have a mailing list you sign up there or, or I'll be posting my updates on the course there as well. Nice. What have you been up to Dylan? I know you've been knee deep in making a new website. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, other than pulling my hair out with, uh, dealing with, uh, contractors, uh, <laughs> I've been, uh, professionally and personally coincidentally, uh, I've been de dedicating a lot of time to a application I'm call calling video dev docs, uh, which, um, at some point in time, you'll go to video dev docs.com and it will be there. But one of my goals for 2019, and I, I, one thing I like to do every year is I, I create goals, professional goals, and things I want to accomplish. And going to a conference this year was one of them. Uh, releasing a new course was another one. This podcast was one of them. And launching a fully functional web application that is going to um, be something that I'd be proud of and production, a production level application and, you know, figure out ways to monetize that as we've, you know, everything I try to monetize. Uh, but the cool thing about this is I've always wanted to build this app, which is essentially a cross between MDN and, and uh, W3 schools and then takes video aspect of it. So that hence the video dev doc. So it's a documentation site that has all to do with video and it's allowed me not only to dive deeper into angular and uh, angular universal. So it's going to be, um, you know, render on the server, but get to use um, RxJS a little bit more to handle some 
some um, open data streams. I'm building it as a progressive web app. It's fully tested. I think right now it has about 85% test coverage. So as I've been developing it, it's been going. And so that's been like my, you know, I, I first had to get that course out. And then now it's like I've been live. Oh, one of the cool things about this, I've been live streaming the majority of me building it and doing like a lot of the grunt work outside, like dealing with like designing and, and uh, you know, discovering what features I want to release with and do that alpha version. And, and uh, it's been a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, but besides that, I've, uh, I recently had a meeting with like LinkedIn learning. So that'd be kind of cool to, um, you know, we're in the talks with them about getting some content out on their platform. And uh, some of my content just uh, got is getting leased with Thinkster. And so that should be out relatively soon. And, you know, making a course for them and all this sort of cool stuff that um, keeps me very busy. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, stuff I'm very passionate about. Uh, but uh, it'll be exciting when I release this, which I think by the time this is out, it might be out, maybe a very early alpha. But um, if not, it'll be coming soon. Cool. Where if people are listening today, and they, where should they go to look for it? Videodevdocs.com. Uh, that's nice. basically it. It'll, it'll be there. It'll be nice. And it'll be. Uh, it's going to be the new hotness in terms of there hasn't been a lot of change in the game when it's come to dev documentation, but we're taking over. All right. <laughs> and it's hundred percent free too. So hundred percent free. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'll try to monetize everything, but, um, some, some affiliate links, stuff like that. But the goal here is to create nice free content. Um, that's not only for junior or aspiring developers, but also senior developers and add a video form to it. Yeah, can't wait. Sounds cool. Yeah, I think we both have cool stuff coming up the pipeline. I think we're, we're from, uh, if you're listening here, we're going to have start doing more updates on what we've been working on at the beginning of our podcasts, just because I think, beginning of this podcast, that is, just because I think it's it's interesting and, and we're, we're doing interesting things we'd like to share with you guys. All right, so today's main topic is negative mindsets. So I think we've touched about the, touched upon this on a previous podcast, but today I just want to get all into it and just talk about some of the things that I've seen, you know, as a software developer, some of the uh, frameworks and, and places where I see this happening, and then a little bit of how to overcome it as well. And uh, I just want to start with one thing that I think that's sort of tangentially related to negative mindset, and that is imposter syndrome. Um, what, what do you think about imposter syndrome? What does that mean to you, Dylan? Um, so this is, it's so, so strange. I recently had a conversation with this. So I, I've been doing a lot of interviews for my work. And one of the things, what, occasionally I get recognized when I get in this interviews, which is always bonus points. So good luck on that, but not going to pass you through because of it. But <laughs> um, at the end, we had some extra time. And the the guy I was interviewing clearly, and he had, how do you get over imposter syndrome? Because he was going on like 10 years of experience, but still felt like he was just like tricking the system. And and I think part of it, at least part of the way that I've gotten over it, and I, I think a lot of dev, devs do this, is they're very passive in their careers instead of very active. And so when you're very active in your career, you start picking up a lot and you start... Um, maybe gain a little bit of confidence because it's oftentimes a confidence thing. Um, but I, I also think that now that more devs are becoming either, you know, self-taught or through boot camps, that they sometimes feel like they've missed out on some key things in a computer science program. And that sort of tends to lead to this sort of imposter syndrome. I think part of the reason that I don't feel this way, and I don't think I've, I don't think, I, I don't know if I've ever really felt this way. And in, and people have different definitions of imposter syndrome. I, I like the one you're talking about there. But it, basically, the, the definition, if you look in the dictionary or in Wikipedia, it's the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own effort or skills. And the way I feel about it, and you, you go back to having a college degree, like I went through getting a college degree and getting into and getting a computer science degree at that and getting into software development right out of college. And even with a software development degree, I had problems getting a job right away. You know, it was 2008, 2007. The economy was not doing great in the area I was living in. But even after all that, I never thought like that I was an imposter or like I didn't deserve to have the jobs. I always thought like I always deserved to have the jobs. Like I always thought 
that the reason I didn't get them was because I didn't work hard enough. I didn't um, understand the concepts enough and I didn't, I wasn't good enough during the interviews to get the job. So I've, I guess it's, it's something where I keep, I hear a lot of people say, and it's, it's a real struggle for a lot of developers. Um, it's just something I don't, you know, I haven't personally experienced that much, but I definitely see that people, people do experience this. I think it's overused a little bit, you know, um, it seems like anytime someone's a little afraid of something or has anxiety about some position, they say, oh, it's imposter syndrome. And I don't think it's that. It, it can be a debilitating problem for some people. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make here. Yeah, and it can be something where sometimes you set unrealistic expectations for where you are in your career. Like I have people who show up to these live streams are like, I have no idea what's going on. Like, well, how long have you been a developer? He's like, I'm not a developer yet. Well, all right, clearly, because we're building something that's production level and you need to make sure that you set your sights in what, like you may be at where you're trying to understand for loops. You, you shouldn't just be like, yeah, I'm going to build this um, progressive web app that's using server side stuff. And you have to understand where you're at, where you want to go is good, but not let that sort of intimidate you. Yeah, not don't let it intimidate you and also make sure you stay and have a positive attitude towards it all that you can do things. There's a lot of psychology behind this of of knowing that what you can and can't do and being able to um, not limit yourself. There's a lot of limiting beliefs out there. Let, let's move on to other places where I see uh, <laughs> negative attitudes or negative mindsets. Um, since we both work in web development, I think we both have our frameworks that we love and we hate. Um, you know, tech typically uh, there's these things like called framework wars. You know, um, I see this a lot in the different communities. Like, for example, I've seen tweets that have gone retweeted thousands and thousands of times that were literally just "I love React." Like people love that's really positive. But I've also seen tweets that have gone thousands and thousands of retweets that are like Ember is dead. Like Ember JS is a it's JavaScript framework. It got really popular about the same time Angular JS one came out, and in those times where Backbone was popular, it's one of the very first single page application JavaScript frameworks. But it it uh, it hasn't gone as much. Uh, it hasn't gone as popular um, on, and I kind of rate popular by the amount of npm downloads, by the number of people putting questions in Stack Overflow and, and Googling and, and overall developer awareness as things like React and, and Vue and Angular at this point, Angular 2+. Plus. But, you know, em Ember still has a live, you know, pretty active community. If you go, I've been to EmberConf a couple of years ago when people, all everybody said Ember is dead and they have thousands and thousands of developers or hundreds, yeah, thousands of developers at their conferences. There's still an active community. The, it still has a six-month recently release cycle. So that's kind of one example of, of a lot of negativity for one framework, but it's still doing pretty good out there. Um, another common one is PHP. I know I hear a lot of hate for PHP. If you don't know, PHP runs all your WordPress sites. They're written with PHP. And sometimes people kind of look down on PHP developers, maybe because they think that it's too easy or it's a beginner. Um, but it, it's still really powerful, and there's plenty of jobs out there for PHP developers and uh, it's great. Yeah, I, I know I'm guilty of this. I, so I am totally okay shitting on technologies, uh, <laughs> which um, I would say I, I necessarily shit on is probably bad uh, terminology, but I do think um, it's okay to look at a technology, see its state in terms of the industry, whether it's increasing or decreasing in popularity, because typically that then increases or decreases your uh, viability as a candidate. And like how much money goes up. So like statistically speaking, you'll make more money doing JavaScript than you would PHP. And more projects are started in JavaScript than PHP. And then there are also, there's also like older technologies that I feel need to die, but people hold on to. <laughs> um, jQuery being one of them. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, so I, um, I don't necessarily agree that this is a negative mindset. As long as you take an analytical approach to it. And I think the... Uh, I think when people are tweeting, I love React, and then people tweet, I hate React, I think every developer can love and hate the technology that they're working at, depending upon the day. I know I can. Like, I typically like Angular, but there's some times where if Angular 
was a physical being. I put my hands on it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you, you, come on, we gotta, we gotta all gotta get along. There. But yeah, yeah, there's, I guess there's a def. Let me think about this. So there's there's differences between so, like being frustrated with a framework, mm-hmm. and there's and then and you know having that kind of side, and then there's the differences between like a really old framework, like if you're like SOAP or ASP or something that's not being, I'm sure some ASP developers listening right now that says this is being maintained still, but some technology that's no longer being maintained and then kind of having a negative mindset to that. Um, I don't know. I think, I think there's differences between the two and just try to realize that every tool has its, its purpose and Yes, there's some technologies that should die and people shouldn't be using anymore. Um, there's some current technologies like PHP. I think that it's okay. I mean, maybe PHP isn't your preference, but I think the idea of like everybody bashing P- PHP is not is not good. I I mean, I I it's 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 okay to have an opinion about these things. I think when I uh, was it GitHub or Stack Overflow does like what's your most hated language. I think uh, JavaScript and PHP were like number one and number two. <laughs> and so like yeah, there's plenty of jobs in JavaScript, but it's also still very hated. Um, and same with PHP. So, uh, you know, it, it does, but you can't argue with stats that PHP runs like 90% of the web. It's just mm-hmm. that 90% no one goes to anymore, but it still, it still <laughs> runs it. I remember too, I, I, I was at a conference once and I bumped into a group of developers and we had... You know, at most conferences, they place you in, you can just go to any table and just talk to random people. And, and I was doing that. And one com- one conference goer just hated Microsoft so much to the point where, like, they said, the only thing I ever use for Microsoft is GitHub. I'm like, well, you know, and they didn't even want to use GitHub after Microsoft acquired them because they were like total Apple fanboys. And I'm like, that's a little, that's a little crazy. That's a little, um, much but you know that's how some people are and and that's 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 who they are i guess the point being is that there, there's an you can definitely like hate different software frameworks you, you can definitely do this but um i guess maybe when it gets to the point of you shaming other people for using it then that might be crossing a line and it's okay that you know a lot of people hate javascript time and hate pop php but when you shame other people um that's not good let me move on to um, being in a team and negative mindsets in a team. So it's easy. Um, it's easy to put people down based on their knowledge and um, a good team will have kind of a, um, you'll have your senior developers. You might have some kind of intermediate developers and some junior developers. And I really think in a good team that those, those senior developers should be really mentoring I think you agree with me on this, Dylan. The junior junior developers, you know, explaining best practices and telling them what they should, what they're doing wrong, and what they're doing right too, and giving them positive feedback. And in the same instance, the junior developers should really be um, should understand the problems that are happening, be willing to um, take feedback and become better. Yeah, I think I- that kind of fosters a real positive relationship in your environment. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And like one thing I'm, I always do at any team that I'm on is always sort of knowledge transfers where if I see something that someone's doing incorrectly, I, hey, you know, 10 minutes after stand up, let me give a quick demo to the entire team because chances are they're not the only one that doing it. And perhaps maybe by me giving uh, this knowledge sharing where, hey, let me give this demo, they might be like, that's cool. Someone else might say, I got an even better way now you sit down and take notes, Dylan. <laughs> like, uh, but uh, I think, so I think no, uh, knowledge sharing is something that we all should do. And um, I also got asked in the last stream, what is the difference between a good junior developer and a bad junior developer? And the, the simple answer is a good junior developer and any good developer understands they have room for growth. And I've worked with developers at multiple levels who think that, look, they, they can do what they want and they got it there and, good enough is good enough. And then I've worked with developers who are like, Hey, cool. How can we make it better? How can I continue to grow? How can I continue to gain that knowledge? And that way you don't end up repeating that, you know, 10 years experience, but you've only really repeated that first year 10 times. 
that kind of goes to the next part, code reviews. I, th- uh, I know some developers that love code reviews, but I think most of them hate it. And any, they don't like being critiqued on their code. I think some people who are doing code reviews feel, and I felt this too sometimes where like, I don't want to be overly critical to someone's code review because I feel like they would take it negatively and they, it hurts people's feelings uh, sometimes. But this is the perfect time you should probably be doing, um, you should be actually be a little bit more cri- critical as long as you're not too pedantic and you're not you know, giving them crap in every little tiny line. I mean, what is your thoughts on, on that? I think it's the perfect time to be critical. Um, and I think it's also, you can be as, like, I, I have no problem to say, hey, fix the spacing here. Like, like, like <laughs> to some people, that would drive them insane. But these are things that, like, on the most fundamental level in a pull request, spacing and formatting and linting is not something that you should even have to think about. You should just auto do it. Um, now, most some developers are like, look, if it doesn't break, I don't want you to leave a comment. And that's a really bad idea to leave because there's plenty of ways that you can write something that works, but it can't be maintained. That, you know, how, how many of us have worked in crappy legacy projects that you're like, why in the world is this a 250 line function? Like what, what, what is going on here? It doesn't adhere to the single responsibility principle. It doesn't adhere to the open close principle. None of this. And it, it's breaking. It's so, this sort of goes back to your, your, the first point about you know, junior developers and developers in general being open to feedback and open to growing. And I think code reviews, if you're open to it, if you're open to having someone who's going to say, hey, what do you think about this? And giving maybe an example and why um, and actually learning from it. I personally love doing code reviews and I love having my code reviewed. But you know, I, would, I would say the majority of developers don't. I would agree because they, they take it code code is a very artistic thing at times. And when you say that your art is ugly, whether you're nice about it or not, some people can't handle that. And most, most developers, um, I really do feel like they, they're stuck in that junior or mid level and they don't really want to grow. And they, they just think, Hey, I got years of experience. That's all I need. And they, I don't want to do any more in code reviews when you're trying to make them better. A lot of people aren't open to it, unfortunately. Yeah. What do you do if you're in the opposite and you receive a code review, but you don't agree with some of the comments? Can you then do you comment back to them in the same, like in the same PR? Yeah. So um, it depends if they're in the same room as me. You know, a lot of times we're oftentimes working with external developers or remote or you're in a different country. Like it, it could, um, but I've had this happen a couple of times where, you know, one of my, one of my colleagues has commented on here and um, where I'm like, I think you're wrong. Um, and let me, uh, let me tell you why. And, um, I've had, I had to, well, where they've responded back now, no, you're wrong. And let me tell you why. And so I always try and take it a, a point where I don't necessarily want to enforce my styles and my guidelines, but what is best practices and what can communicate a better product and as long as you try and take out ego and you try to take out what you think is best and really just have, okay, well, this is why you should do it. And, and, you know, you adhere to things like readability and, and, you know, maybe if you're using angular, the angular style guide, whatever it is, I try to stick to things that like, Hey, this isn't an opinion. And this is, this is actually a better item. And this is why. So, um, I've been on both sides of the coins and I've, I've learned some things and, um, some things you can let go, some things you don't. And, um, oftentimes what I find is when people move forward without like the suggestions, they don't want to listen to you that you, you know, six months later you get bit in the butt by it and you're like, well, I sort of told you. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, one other thing to add to that point and we'll move on is that if you try to, if you do a code review and you have an idea of something's wrong and there's a difference of opinion between you and the code reviewer or you're the code reviewer and the, and the person you're reviewing has a difference. Some organizations, I did this in mind, we created a best practices document where we just kind of dumped on like, you know, we should have tests in here and we, we believe end to end tests should go here and that, you know, we follow TS lint rules and that we need prettier setup that helps auto format your code. And so we have like a, a group of rules in place just in a confluence document, which is a kind of like a wiki 
P, uh, wiki. So we have that in place. So if there is a disagreement on something, we can refer, refer back to our best practices document and say, oh, we decided to make that rule here. And if it's not in the best practices document, then you can add it into the best practices document. So if it ever comes up again, then like, oh yeah, we, this is how we should do it. We should make this, this should be a section, not a div or something like that. And one last thing is say what you mean, but don't say it mean. You know, keep that in mind when you're doing code reviews. I'm still learning how to do code reviews well, and I think I, I still, um, to be a good code reviewer and to review other code, it does take time and practice like anything else. One of the, uh, so let's move on to online, uh, some kind of negative mindsets we see online. So uh, there's, I, the, when I think of negative, I think of Twitter and Reddit and, and things like that. Like Twitter uh, is really great for developers. If you're not on Twitter, I, I'd say you should be on Twitter. If social media is not your thing, I think Dylan, you know, you're not a big social media fan. It's okay. I'm not a huge fan of Twitter, period. Uh, <laughs> I, I have sort of a, a funny side note on Twitter. Um, a little while back, I applied to Twitter because I, I was like, okay, cool. Maybe, you know, let's, they're a big company. Let's see what's out there. And I just remember going through the, um, I remember going through the the application and they asked my gender pronoun and I was like, where is the legend? Because that's, that's how I want you to refer to me. But it was it was one of those things where it was like, God, we gotta this is this is this is a Twitter application right now. It's, and I was dying. I was dying as I did it. And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, legend's pretty good. Or ninja. You could have been ninja. That's a little too on the nose the 10x uh so one thing i've seen recently like some opinions there's a lot of nonsense on twitter so and if you've ever looked at any politics uh, pl politicians on twitter both on both sides if you're in the united states or even around the world there's just so much so much negativity and and just outright nastiness but that's okay that's their right people will put it out there i try to stay away from that stuff of one cool, I don't know, interesting trend that I seen recently was there was this 10x developer meme that kind of went around on Twitter. So this guy that like this Indian startup investor listed what he believed a 10x developer was. I'll put this in the show notes. And it kind of blew up because some of the things they were saying was just like insane, like 10x developers, you know, faster typing and, and does all these all these things that were, was kind of just nonsense. And everybody was bashing on this guy and and putting on crazy comments on, and then I just think that it kind of went a little too far. I mean, yes, you can disagree with somebody, but when you go into the part, part where you're bashing people, that's not great. Um, Reddit, Hacker News, Twitter, or just there's a lot of toxic, toxicity there. Another quick story I have is uh, there's another YouTuber called Joshua Fluke. He, um, someone like targeted him on, there's a subreddit on Twitter or excuse me, Reddit, excuse me. Uh, that's like a forum on Reddit, which is a place where people can go and talk, where people were talking about CS career questions. And someone had made this huge thread, like bassing Joshua Fluke, because he, um, a lot of his videos are about new developers and how to like look for, um, look for, let me think like how, how to be a better developer and, but he does have some negative things where he makes fun of, of how recruiters work and, and he's a big proponent of Lambda school. And so this guy made this big, huge thread on how he hated Joshua fluke. Um, so stuff like that, you know, there's a lot of toxicity, you know, I, I, mean, I just ignore that type of stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of salty dudes on the internet. Uh, <laughs> we could go on platform after platform. Um, and, it could all be summed up as haters going to hate. All right. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's always going to be, there's always going to be people who see other people succeeding on the internet and are hateful about it because they're not succeeding. And they, it's hard. It's easy. It's easier to throw stones than to change your situation. Okay. Is there valid stuff when it comes to Joshua fluke and saying, uh, having an opinion about, you know, completely dumping on college and, and working for companies? Sure. There's always two sides of the coin, but, um, you know, you have these also so-called experts on the internet 
with who are anonymous sources. I have, well, I work for Google. I got 20 years experience. Let me tell you why he's wrong. He's like, bro, you don't even have a profile pic. All right. Like what are you talking about right now? <laughs> we'll just, I guess we'll just take your word for it, man. Uh, but yeah, there's always going to be people on all these platforms that are salty and um, throwing hate rather than, than facts. And you have to just be able to ignore those people. You know, as a new developer, if you're listening or you're, you hear a developer that's been on doing this for many, many years, you have to kind of just take that with a grain of salt, ignore the negativity, and just keep with the positivity. Yeah, Trolls are really – go ahead. I was going to say, to, to that point, one thing as, you know, we've both experienced sort of being out there in a sort of a semi-public level, right, with our channels and all that stuff, is you always get those people just show up, live stream, tell you you're a piece of shit, and, you know, they hope you die. Uh, you know, typical stuff. Um, when I first started YouTube, I tried to talk with these people because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. What you have to understand is that there's some people that are just lost causes. Just block them. You get someone who sends you one negative message, block. That's it. There's no point in responding to these people. They're not there to have an intellectual conversation. They're not there to have a debate. They are there simply to tell you how awful you are and because that's what they enjoy doing. So if you have this negativity and in the world of the internet, you have this simple ability on every social media platform to simply block, hide, delete, and get rid of these negative people in your life, on your, in your internet life, which is a large portion of life, it feels like nowadays. So go ahead and take advantage of that. I have a story that kind of, I was actually, I opened up myself to some criticism. I had, uh, on my YouTube channel, I try to stay really positive and I try to do tutorials. But at one point, a couple of years ago now, I thought it would be a good idea to get into this kind of negative negativity cycle that sometimes YouTube has. And if you don't know, like anything on YouTube, usually if you write something controversial or something negative, um, if you put in like a something like, you know, the three problems with JavaScript, that'll get a lot more clicks than the three best tips for JavaScript. You know, people kind of feed on that negativity a little bit and it's kind of fun to hear people rant. I think that's, you know, that's what people that's half, do. That's half of my commentary in this podcast. Is <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I had gotten into, there was a couple of other YouTubers that had thought um, that started kind of bashing each other. Like they were, one YouTuber had quit their channel and this person made a whole video about why they were awful and why they should, um, I don't want to name names here, but why they quit their channel. And then this person started putting up a beef against this person and creating videos for it. And so they were like, it's funny if, if you think you YouTube and we're in this kind of small programming niche, there's still the same sort of schoolyard tactics that you see everywhere with people. You know, you look funny, you look stupid. I'm going to make a video about it. So I try to, be a little edgy and I made a video on a pretty popular YouTuber telling them that I wasn't like making fun of them, but I said, you know, I really want to create really quality content that will do better than your content. And I don't know if I called them by, by name, I might have, but it had erupted into this huge flame war with this other YouTuber where they had made a a response video to mine and they had a much bigger audience. They didn't name me by name, but people in the comments threw my channel name in there. And I had literally for two days, I had hundreds of like negative comments on one of my videos. I had death threats. I had people telling me to go kill myself. Um, to it got to the point where I was like, this is crazy. And I think I, the video was only up for two days I deleted my video, I took down the video, and then I emailed that other YouTuber saying I was getting, you know, I would get a lot of negativity and, and death threats and if he would take down his video, and he did. Um, so I, after that point, this was a few years ago, I was like, I am never getting, <laughs> I'm never gonna do this. And it was like a big learning lesson of like, you know, that's not me, I'm not like Mr. Edgy, a guy trying to pick fights with other people. Yeah, it's just a, it's a good life lesson too of, you know, oftentimes we, we want to, we, we want to be, we, sometimes we want to be somebody we're not. And you'll, if you just sort of accept yourself for who you are and pr present yourself as who, 
who you want to be, I should say, um, you know, you'll be happier and you'll be more successful typically. Yeah. And I definitely feel like being myself is being more positive and, and helping people than trying to like bring up fake controversy or negativity. Um, by the way, that the other YouTubers, you know, I'm happy with all those other YouTubers. I've chatted with them. I'm still friends with them, you know, online friends with them. So everything's good. It was just got a little intense there for a minute when I started trying to be more edgy. What do you think about controversial topics? Do you think that that's okay? I mean, everybody has an opinion. Is it okay to throw up a controversial opinion to? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think um, controversy is fine as long as you are respectful. I don't know how much controversy there's going to be in uh, software development, but <laughs> um, well, I mean, let me give you an example. Like, do you think, like, for example, there's a lot of videos and, and a lot of YouTubers out there that are soliciting advice for new developers. And a trend that we've seen lately is either um, day in the life of videos where they're completely unrealistic to what a real developer does. Or they're saying, you know, you this one developer, I saw a video the other day that was, um, this developer got a devel- learn how to be a developer in one day and got a job. Or they got a job in one month or three months, or six months. Do you think that's more ins- inspirational or it's a little too negative because it gives unrealistic expectations to new developers? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's clickbait more than anything else. <laughs> and so like, you're, you know, can't, I, I suppose if you random, if you showed up and like, hey, I'd like to learn to code and I had an internship that was free and I was like, sure, show up, whatever. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Like, could it happen? Yeah. What are, what's the likelihood? Like, let's just, you know, 99.99% of the time, most people aren't going to get a, get alert. Most people by day zero, by day 30, when they've never done coding before, are going to go and get a junior level job. It just doesn't happen. Um, can it happen? Sure. I could go out and buy a lotto ticket and just rake it in too. But I, so I think, I think as long, you know, I'm not, I don't do clickbait titles. I, I, I hate them. And I recognize that they work because people, they see that. If you want, if you want to get a number one video, all you got to do is put JavaScript is dying, right? In all caps <laughs> and like three exclamation points. And you can do it once every two months. And that video will be your number one video for every single two months. But you just need to, as long as, I don't know. It, it's scummy. That's what it is. It's, it's sort of scummy, but I, I think it's okay. Um, I had someone on my channel who got their first uh, job two months in that I interviewed, and it was a 25-minute interview talking about his process, what he went through, and it set a very realistic idea of like, look, I started every single day. I, 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 I asked if I could work for free, and he sort of had this thing. Now, if it's a video where you go and you're like, yo, I got a job in a week. I showed up. I just went on Codecademy. They gave me 80 grand. It was crazy. Like, like it's, it's, it has to be some realism to it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can get into clickbait titles really easily. And I've done a few. I know one, I know one YouTuber that's pretty popular that every month or two, he does the top 10 programming languages, the top 10 for top five frameworks, but he does like, um, like six or seven times a year. And he knows that at least one of those will go like somewhat viral. I just think it's funny. All right. Well, back to the topic of negativity. You know, I, I think we covered a lot here. You know, I, I think the point being of all this is that, you know, as Dylan succinctly put, you know, anytime you're on the internet, there's going to be trolls. You got to ignore them. If you're working with frameworks, pick the one that you like the most. Sometimes, um, you know, I, I think just keep with it. Don't worry about people that may try to shame you into different frameworks. You know, if you like Ember.js, you know, go with Ember.js. Yes, you're, it's not going to be as popular as React. There's not as many jobs out there, but it's fine. You can jump into it. If you like WordPress, you know, stick with WordPress. You like it. And then, uh, you know, in, on, if you're on a team, make sure you can take advice. Make sure you can, um, don't be afraid to do those code reviews. Don't be afraid to receive feedback from your code. Don't take it as a personal attack on you. Try to learn from it and try to keep learning. I think that's all I got today. Do you have anything else, Dylan, you want to add? Yeah, the only thing I, I'd say as we wrap up here is that I, I'm very big on negative role models and people that you don't want to end up like. And so if you have some negativity in your life, whether it's trolls, whether it's coworkers, whether it's hell family members, um, keep a very strong uh, mental image of 
what it is you don't want to become. And oftentimes you'll find that you go and become what you want to become and uh, just use that negativity for fuel because the, the greatest thing that you can do for someone who's hating on you is just be successful. So, you know, take that uh, and just uh, use it and create those mental images because it, it's really helped me and sort of my, the journey of software development and life for that matter. Awesome. Peace. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to find more about what I'm up to, go to dylanisrael.com. And if you want to know what I'm up to, you can check out my website at eric.video. If you haven't already, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And if you do, you might even be featured on our next episode. Don't forget to check out the website at selftaughtornot.com. From there, you can sign up for a mailing list where we give away free courses and a bunch of cool stuff. And we'll also let you know when the next episode comes out. And finally, if you didn't know, we have a Facebook group. It's called Code Tech and Caffeine. We have over 10,000 members. And you can find the link at selftaughtornot.com. So come join us. We have tons of developers willing to help you guys, mentor you guys. Check it out. Just make sure you go to selftaughtornot.com and check out the Code Tech and Caffeine link. Thanks and take care.